What I, I want to be able to um, uh, do with the audience is try and make it a little bit interactive. It's a, it's a nice size, so I have got a set lot of slides, but I'm happy to, to engage people at any time. Um, I've got an interesting slide to start with, and uh, to kick us off, Sasha Sawyer is the one going diagonally across the, um, the first slide, and he's interesting, isn't he? He's a hurdler, he's a vaulter, he's a sprinter, and he's a jumper. And this is one of the things that I'm really keen on trying to engage people in, and that's that, do we ask our kids to specialise too early? And I think in some cases we do, because what we do is we don't engage their whole body. When we get them to do something really specialised from a young age, we sometimes restrict the skill sets that we, we can develop within that child. My concern, and I've had a little bit of time with Sasha, and he spends a bit of time with my son. So he's been to Adelaide twice and spent time at our home. Incredibly humble kid who is very respectful of his home and also um, our home environment. Um, I have certain rules at my place, uh, which don't quite transfer over to his place. And his mother and I had an interesting chat about that, but I brought him in. I said, Sash, I get where you come from and your background, but whilst you are in my home, these are the rules. And um, as you can imagine, he doesn't have any problems with social media and or uh, company, both male and female. So it was an interesting experience. The two other people that uh, I've got either side of Sash are Melinda Gainsford. Um, hopefully this works. Yes. When she was about 15 years old and there when she was uh, at the Olympics and the change in that and how that happens. It doesn't happen overnight. I took both Mel and Kathy away on their first international trip in 1989. I made my first team with AA as a therapist. I then uh, evolved uh, as a coach and then went away as a team manager. So I've had a, a quite an interesting journey. So what I want you to think about is we don't just get that and that overnight. It takes a long time. Unlike uh, rowing and cycling, they can grab someone who has never done that sport before and within two years put them on the international stage. It is near impossible in track and field to do that. The AFL have also been quite successful where they've grabbed people from other sports and transitioned them in. You can't do that in soccer. If you haven't played the game from a young age, it's near impossible to make it. And there are very few exceptions. I think there's one in the last 20 years within the Socceroos that has actually started late or hasn't been part of the pathway and went to a World Cup. So that's how I want to uh, engage. So that I want to talk a brief history of, of my journey. I've sort of started that anyway. I want to talk about my core values and I really put a high value on that. And part of that has been developed with my team sports involvement. And I think far too often we look at track and field in a cocoon instead of looking at the broader world. And I think you can learn an enormous amount from that. And I'll talk about the things that really do make that coach-athlete relationship really stick. You know, I'm sick and tired of hearing, oh, this coach isn't good enough or that coach isn't good enough, yet the athlete's quite successful. Maybe, maybe it's just that relationship's at the key point. I worked in the system, I worked prior to that outside of the system where I had to fund myself to go to the Commonwealth Games, you know, and I've, I've had a hard road of it. It cost me 20 grand, 98, and Jagan Haynes got a gold medal and a massive PB. Did I get reward? Everybody else got paid. I didn't in terms of the reward and they forgot me. And that's when I went to the AFL. So I think in 98, I think, I think the three of us, it was John Quinn, myself, uh, one other, I think John, the, uh, the AFL came in and raped us all. So Athletics Australia lost three quite experienced people who would have stayed in the sport had we had an opportunity to stay in the pathway. And I'm sure John will talk about that tomorrow. I'm going to talk about building an athlete, making him robust and doing it from the ground up. Far too often, it's like a bit of a cake. People like the icing, but if you haven't got a good substance underneath to be able to draw from, you're never going to get any value or nutrition out of it. So I'm going to use that as an analogy to build that. Injury prevention is my keystone. 
because I'm a therapist, I have very, and I have had over 30 years, and it can't be like very, very few injuries within my group. People that come in in track and field into my group are generally broke and they come to me to get fixed. And then we go on and, and move on. I've had three really good examples. Jagan Holmes, who couldn't ever get to an Olympics, didn't ever get to Olympics, which is really disappointing, but went to a Commonwealth Games with a PB and kept on breaking at all the majors. Um, Dmitry Markov was another classic example who, of someone who was broke and then uh, left Perth for a number of reasons um, and family as well, and then got him uh, in 2006 over the line. Very tough for someone who'd never coached pole vault. So, you know, the skill sets that we have, you've just got to go step back a bit and don't think you're in a little spot. You can actually transfer those skill sets. As I've done with football, basketball, soccer, you can use them. You've just got to think outside the square. I'm going to talk a little bit about testing and monitoring and the importance of it. And then at the end of the day, I'm going to just uh, offer people an opportunity to ask some questions and also uh, throw up a round table option for people to do. So hopefully that gives you an idea of where I'm going. So when, if you get, hopefully I don't get lost, but I've got a little thing on my back. So if I get offline, uh, Blair and Jill are gonna buzz me and I'll get an electric shock. Okay, so spoken, I was an athlete, not a very good athlete. And I think that's what's made me a far better coach because what I couldn't make the school athletics team in first year at Adelaide High. And I was quite determined to just work hard and understand how to improve. And from there, by the time I was in year 12, I made our first senior state team and went to Tassie. So what that taught me was how to build blocks and what I needed to do. Some of our better athletes come out into the track and they know what they're doing. You know, they're quite successful, yet when they get older, they struggle with the challenge of having to work hard or having to work out challenges. I think some of our best athletes have have gone through challenges. And I think that's one of the things that us as coaches need to recognise. You don't necessarily have to be a very successful athlete to be a successful coach. I've been fortunate enough that I've been a conditioner, high performance manager in a large number of organisations. I now go in and consult. And um, it's quite interesting seeing uh, how that's evolved. And I've used a lot of the things that I've grabbed out of the um, team sports within my own individual coaching philosophy. And I've worked in, in the system, as I said before, I work, and I've worked outside the system either side of it. So I was in the system for six years full time. And um, I think that's really important to um, understand that I'm not a paid coach. So I can, I'm, <coughs> I'm very empathetic with the personal coach and, and understand what I think needs to happen. I've got a slightly different view than the current philosophy that I believe that the personal coaches, they provide 95% of our team. I think we could potentially engage in the personal coach a bit more and value add as well. And I've also worked for the IAAF over a long period of time from 2001 right through to now. And I did their very, very first coach education course level three. So what happened was they developed it, sat in a, they, gave me this uh, presentation, gave me 20 minutes to read it and said, right now, go out and present it. So what they did was they wanted to see whether anybody could grab that material and run with it. And I had Mr. Muller, Mr. Gunter in the back. I had uh, Fletcher, Peter Thompson um, sitting at the back assessing me. So when you've got arguably five or six of the world's leading coach educators sitting there, assessing you and then we went out for dinner that night and had a glass of red and I remember uh, um, Lauren saying not bad I'd do it a little bit different I said mate you've got 20 years experience or 30 years experience on me so that was good so when I went away with the IAAF I had three weeks with these guys so we used to live in this hotel for three weeks so the best P, um, PD I did was actually live with these guys yes I presented but more important, I've got to see them present. And then in the evening, we'd sit down with a glass of red or, or, or a beer and go through a whole lot of stuff. So I did, I think, about 10 of them in about eight years. And I, that was probably the best PD I've ever done. Going to a course like that is great, right? It feels fluffy. But what I'd love you to do is connect. And if you do that, that's the thing that I know has helped me grow as a coach. And the connections that you guys will have within this room and the vast knowledge this room collectively has is enormous, far better than any one of our uh, presenters um, can articulate. 
So I'll, that's what we're going to try and get to. My core values, really important, and I am really strong in that. Anybody who knows me and seen the way I run my group, I do not deviate at all. Um, the first and most important thing, the, most of the kids in my group, well, all of them I would hope, love coming out to training and love the environment. Why? Because I select the kids really carefully. I do not interview kids. I interview parents. Because the, the values these parents give invariably are transferred to their kids. So I'm very, very careful about who I bring into the group because I really cherish the uh, uniqueness and the energy that that brings. They're not all superstars. I have kids who are just happy to run down the track and if they make a state final, they're, they're wrapped. But for me, they, they turn up to, to run PBs. They don't, they're not there to win national medals. You can have those kids, and I've got three or four who are in that space, but the rest of them are basically hardworking kids who just enjoy the sport. And they are important fabric of the group. It's not the superstars, as we call them, or sometimes call them. Um, so it's really important how you work out who comes into your group. And one bad egg, I tell you, makes it tough. Uh, I have some really fine rules in my group. Uh, if you don't turn up, I need a text or something so I know, so I've got equipment and stuff. That's really important. No phones are used at training. If you have a phone, you go home. Um, and uh, we, I've moved one child on in the last five or six years who stepped outside of the boundaries. One of them was took some drugs, so he went out. Don't want that being influenced. And if you haven't finished your homework, you can't turn up to training. I'm a big, big fan of kids ha having a balanced life. So... Uh, no, hungry jacks, no hungry jacks and fast food in front of me, dead against that. No soft drinks. So that's another rule that they won't, that they uh, lie. It's a bit of fun, but yeah. Who makes the decisions? It's generally me engaging with the parents. So when a parent comes up to me and it's happened with the soccer kids, come out and says, oh, little Johnny should be doing this and training and that and training and that and training. When I've got 12 kids there, I go, that's inappropriate. You come and you speak to me tomorrow, make an appointment, we'll discuss it. The next session, the kid had left the session. I don't have parents telling me how to run a program, especially when they've never been involved in the sport. I, I reckon at 40 years of experience in the sport, I reckon I've got a pretty good idea. I treat the kids as if they're my own and they've got to trust me. If they can't do that, I don't want them in the group. I don't want to second guess. I'm sure there'll be other presenters who will say the same. I am not a babysitting service. I do not wipe butts. I did that for four or five years. I had two kids. Um, so uh, I want the kids to become independent and they need to drive it. So when somebody new comes into the group and we take the warm up, one of my lesser experienced kids will take that child through and I'll assess whether that child has gathered and understood all the principles in terms of what we're trying to do in the <coughs> drill and part of that warm up. Our drills, and I'll go through that later, evolve during the course of the year. So all I ever want and I'm very articulate with the kids and I'm very honest. So if they run a poor time, I don't tell them they've, they've run well. I go, right, this went well and da, da 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 but this is the area you need to focus on. I always talk about a positive rather than a negative. And you've got to engage them, so I'm very clear. I have little, I've got one kid at the moment whose mum keep keeps on telling me that the child's got to break the state record. And I basically sat mum down at the end of the year and said, right, if you bring that up once more, you'll find a new coach because you're putting too much pressure on your child. The last two majors that her child's gone to, she hasn't performed well. Run really well during the week. Clearly what happens away from training isn't what I think is sustainable. So mum now has realised, and I don't, when I make a comment like that, I follow it through. So as a coach, if you make a statement, make sure you follow it through. Because I tell you, it will come back and bite you. Oh, because you said that to somebody and it did, you didn't deliver. So be careful if you make things like that. Okay, so the other thing, social media, oh, one of my bears, I think that really bugs me. So um, my kids, and uh, I don't go on social media, but um, if they get caught doing that rubbish, they've got to deal with me. And I can tell you that scared, big time. Da uh, anybody who knows Rose Pittman's an 800 meter runner. Da Dad's uh, David Pittman, dual uh, AFL grand finalist, six foot seven, uh, pretty solid. Uh, went to the Nationals this year 
and we're sitting down having a glass already. He said, you know, my daughter's only afraid of one person. She's just not scared of me. She's generally scared of you. And I thought, oh, that's nice, David. That was good. Little, little 75 kilo person. So that's great. And that's, that's my group there. Uh, very happy. Um, some of the challenges I've had is I've had kids who couldn't make a state final who within 12 months have made a, you know, finished third and fourth at nationals. That's, that's been some of my most enjoyable periods. Coaching my own son, that's another experience in itself. And uh, for parents who have done that, um, it is rewarding, but it's also got its challenges. Okay, building, building blocks. And I think it's really important that we understand what we're doing with these young children. We have a responsibility to be able to build a solid foundation that these kids can move forward from. And I think that's really important. So people do a lot of volume of work without quite understanding the basis of what we're trying to do. Remember, it's a growing body. It will take a lot of load. So yes, they'll be able to cope with it. But in the long term, is that hindering them? And I think we need to understand some of those concepts. We need to understand gradual progression. The, the body will take load, but you need to understand the appropriate load that is uh, suitable for those children at that moment in time. You know, and there's an emotional issue that you've got to take into consideration. The increased complexity of the movements. We can't expect an eight or 10 year old child or a 12, 14 year old child and a 16 and 18 year old child to have the same capabilities in terms of movement pattern proficiency. So understand that it does take time. And I think that's really important to understand how do we do that? And in the practical workshop that I will conduct on the Sunday, I will go through those simplicities. I work on speed first, and then we increase the load. How do you increase load? A number of different ways. Obviously, when you run faster, the load increases, and then volume is the last thing that I do with any child. So for me, it's about the quality of the movement before you move forward, and attention to detail, and I'll talk about every step counts. At the beginning of every year, we revisit all the drills, right back to the basics, because what we do is enhance and build layers of information on top of it. So even though that they're advanced kids compared to the, the lesser advanced kids in my group, they all go back and we go back and we refine those. And you find that what happens at the very end of the year, those benefits and those skills that you've applied come to the fore, particularly at majors. I've been really proud of the fact that a majority of my kids, and in particular the two, um, my two leading ones, Rose Pittman and, and Max, have now competed with me for six years and all of them have never not got a PB or a better performance at a national title. I think Max is up to 23 majors in a row now, uh, and I think Rose is 19, um, which is not too bad. Why? because I never talk about winning, I talk about process, and I talk about the attention to detail. So we come into the majors and I'm really confident, I know what they're gonna do. I don't get surprises at a major. I know roughly where they're gonna be. Now, if a kid beats them, a kid beats them. I've never bothered me, because I keep on looking at the long term. It's about understanding what model you want, and you want them to be able to produce that model under the heat of battle. That's what good coaching's about. They can do it once off, and we've seen that an uh, enormous amount of times. But it's a, the athlete who can produce it on a day-to-day -day basis. And that comes from the environment that you, that you create. It's not a hit and miss thing. You talk to the experienced coach here, and I can see a lot of experience in the room. Um, it doesn't ha just happen by luck. You create that environment. And then what happens is the children within that group or the adults, as my group's going into now, roll that through and then the next generation that comes through will follow that through. So when I first started at SASE, never coached kids before, so I had a bit of a um, learning experience. And then when I made a decision that I wanted to grow up with my kids and I took a massive hit in terms of income, I can tell you, in some of the jobs I've had, they've been, they're reasonable then to come back into the SISAS system and then private practice, it was a bit of a hit. So, but I made a decision that I wanted to grow up with my kids. I wanted to stay in Adelaide. So I've had a, and so they're the, the, the decisions that you make. 
So, and what I did do was really appreciate the little athletics coaching system and, that, and how, how we can enhance that. And I had my difficulties in it at times, but I really enjoyed it as well. And to watch, and I think I've probably become a far better coach now at senior level than I would have than I ever was. Now I'm lucky enough. I I do some consulting. I had Rowan Browning come and spend two weeks with us uh, two weeks ago, and he's coming back next week to Adelaide just to help him with his rehab and stuff. So now I think I'm a far better coach suited now than I was ten years ago when I had a, a fair bit of a success as a senior coach. And just reiterating, I go from a short to a long approach. I never start long. I always start with the first step and just 10s and 20s and 30s as a sprint or, or jumps coach, hurdles coach. So I don't do lots of volume. I don't do any large amount of volume. Rose Pittman has run 205.14 off six and a half Ks a week. People don't believe me, but the people who know how I run a program, yep. Kim, it depends on the time of year. My, my view always is that you can get conditioning by doing short work. Uh, Craig Mottram came and did a warm up with me at the distance coaching course that we took. And Craig's still in pretty good shape. Very good shape. His heart rate got to 180 something and he, could, he, he couldn't walk the next day after one of my warm ups that my sprint group does all the time. So you can build fitness in a slightly different way. You don't have to do it by volume, which is the easy way to go about it, but it's about being a little bit more creative. We can show that uh, session on Sunday. But, you know, and I'm sure John would have come up with that in the football. I mean, this idea of having to run long distances when we both came into the system was just the norm. So we've gone, no, we're getting rid of that. We're going to do a whole lot of short stuff, better quality, higher volume, spend our volume doing it within the ball drills rather than um, standalone running. So I think that's, that's important to understand, Kim, and you can get load in different ways. So fitness comes specific to the event, and, but you can become a little bit more creative. Every step counts. I am a big fan of just making sure if you're going to start teaching something, it is really easy to get a kid to run faster than 100, just get him to run some 120s and 150s. I don't do that. Last year, uh, again, I hate using my son, but he's probably the the one that I've got the most data on in terms of GPS and stuff, we ran um, six 150s uh, and I did this at a conference for the year and, um, and somebody said, is that in a session? I said, no, that was for the whole year. And they said, how can he run a 200 with that sort of volume? I said, well, we do lots of 30s, like we did seven, over 750 30s during the year. So I ran 22.4 up in Cairns into a headwind pouring with rain. He's now started doing some 125s and some 150s. He's going to have a massive jump in his 150s this year. Now, he's 16, 17 years old. If you give that hit to the kids as a 12-year-old, and there's a classic example of a, of a child that I've seen recently who ran a state record as an under 14. She has not improved in two years. Now, two years ago, she was doing <clears throat> sessions of 8 to 10 150s. 12 years old. She's a sprinter. Yep. She hasn't improved, not surprised. Just think about, if they're doing that volume as a 12-year-old, what do they have to do as a 20-year-old to be able to continually improve? And that's what you've got to think about. Yes, they'll run faster when they're older, but the stimulus, the body wants a change of stimulus. If you do that, you will get continual growth. So, and the other thing that I'm really keen on is people do drills. Yeah, if you do them, Know what you're trying to do. What are you trying to get out of it? There are different aspects. We talk about the high marching drill. There's lots of different aspects. The, the foot plant, the trunk position, the arm position, the knee position, the heel position. Think about that. So when we do our drills during the course of the year, I focus on different aspects. And then we evolve that during the course of the year. So people may look at the drills from the outside and go, oh, he's doing the same. Well, we're not actually because we're focusing on different aspects of that particular drill during the different phases of the year. That's called programming. It's thinking ahead. And when you're a therapist like I am, and it keeps on coming back, as a therapist, we progressively load our treatment modalities. So again, I've brought that in. You've got to think about the drill and how that fits into your technical model. You've got to understand what technical model you've got, no matter what event you're doing. So 
if a drill is there because somebody else is doing it and you don't know, I would question whether you're doing it well. And as an IAAF facilitator, I don't, I don't question what people do. I question what their rationale is, more so. I won't might, might necessarily agree with what they're doing, but I never mark people on that. I mark on their rationale and their logic in terms of progression. And I can tell you I've marked well over a couple of thousand papers over the last 20 years. When I was at uni, I think I did 1,200 and something. So that's the, the key thing that I, I've always been strong at. The important thing with the, the drills is, I, is to, to gradually evolve them. And you can evolve them in a number of ways. The distance, the speed that you can conduct the drill, the length that the drill goes, and the recovery between the drills. And you can multi-skill drills. So you can do one drill, followed up by another drill to try and make it a little bit more complex. If you do a drill and you do it multiple times, it becomes quite easy for the kids. But if you do a drill and then throw another one, and then they've got to move between one and the other, that makes it a little bit more complex. So just think about that. And there's lots of roads to roam. The important thing is you need to be able to articulate the message of your model to the athlete. They must have a clear picture. That's where the videos are good. I don't like using videos because it chews up time, takes my focus about what I'm trying to do. We do video once a month, high speed, with GPS, heart rates, and a whole lot of that stuff, and I use that. Because I know over a period of a month, we're not going to get massive changes, but at least I've got a snapshot. So that's what I, I do. Everybody's different, and a lot of people use it and find it quite helpful. Everybody to their own. I don't judge people on that. But again, um, this is a good example where we're focusing on uh, maybe the thigh. He's a little bit too forward for mine, uh, but it's not too bad. His power line's pretty good. So there's a good example. We keep talking about resilience and confidence. And these are a couple of quotes that I've used over a long period of time. And I basically live by them. I think confidence is one of these things that people um, think just comes. It doesn't. It comes when you have a really strong technical platform that drives consistent performance. People who go into an exam, as a classic example, if they know their stuff, they feel really confident. You haven't done the work, you go in there, you lack confidence. Some people go into major championships, not in great condition, but for some reason have the capacity to draw from their experiences and do well. But they've done the work previously. Success as champions is not like, it's just an example of an extension of what I've done. It's like um, going into an exam. You know what the questions are going to be asked. Make sure you've got the answers. Prepare for them. Oh, there's a typo there. Ooh, okay. And the last thing as a coach, um, and we are an important part of their journey. Being an elite athlete, I believe, is a privilege. Many people take sacrifices to assist them through their journey. Family, coaches, and you guys in particular, and us, and me, I, I don't know how much it's cost me over the years to become a coach. And the athletes have to respect that and don't take it for granted. And once they do that, you need to put them in line. Trust me, if you don't, it comes back and bites you on the butt. And I've seen that far too often where coaches have been taken advantage of, the athlete gets to pick his way. If you know your stuff, you stand by the core values that you bring to the table. And I know at a footy club, that's gold. And that's the one thing that I think I brought out of the team sports was um, when I first went with the Socceroos and we had a number of players who were probably earning, I don't know, 30 to 100 grand a week. And Arnie came up to me and said, um, how are you going to deal with them? I said, well, I'll deal with them any way I can. You know, I'll deal with them as I normally do. And we had uh, the then uh, Temperum captain at the time didn't agree with one of the things that we were doing. So I threw him off the ground. He came up to me and he said, you can't throw me off. I said, why not? Uh, and he said, well, I earn $100,000 a week. I said, I don't give a shit how much you earn. This is what we're doing. Out of here. And the rest of the group went, oh, okay. So um, Arnie came back because he had to go to uh, Sydney uh, to do the launch for the Olympics that weekend. He said, oh, I hear you had an interesting conversation with so-and-so, and I won't mention his name. And he said, yep. And he said, do you want me to give me your version? I said, no. Nah. <laughs> he said, I hear uh, he had a problem. Uh, he, you've got a problem? I said, no, uh, Neil's got a problem. So um, he just forked out and said, okay. So after that, we got on pretty well. The last game, we played Argentina. Um, 
came down to breakfast at six o'clock. He sat next to me and uh, he said, um, you know that first day? I said, yep. He said, I was just testing you to see if you were tough enough. I said, yeah, no worries. <laughs> yeah, good on you. <laughs> so we've had a good relationship since then. So it is tough, you know. The superstars who get paid a lot, you know, you've got to learn to deal with them, you know. Strength training and when to introduce it, interesting. <laughs> My group generally don't start until they're 16 because what they do is an enormous amount of body work. We do medicine ball stuff. We do uh, body weight stuff. We do hopping. We do skipping. And we do a lot of skipping. We do a lot of offload skipping. So once a week, uh, some of the kids who have progressed with me over a couple of years, we now do uh, have a pump bar with a, a small weight. So they're, they're doing skipping drills with with three kilos or two kilos on one side. So what's happening is they're learning to, to have to rebalance, offload. And that, um, and that gives them an awesome amount of skill work to go into the gym. So when my kids go into the gym and they learn to do the cleans and the Olympic lifts and all that single leg stuff that we do, they're generally pretty prof proficient because they've learned to do so much of the stuff with a medicine ball prior to that. And we do that at the end of the session. Um, and I do that on a regular basis. One of the things that I'll talk about is, do we really need to teach the ideal model to a 12 year old or a 14 year old or a 16 year old kid? They haven't got the same strength qualities as an, an elite athlete. Good example is block starts. My kids very rarely do block work, but we do an enormous amount of three point starts. I find it so much more beneficial. So what happens is when they get into blocks, their technical models being drilled and honed in by doing stationary stuff. Block work is quite um, loading on the body, particularly young growing kids, particularly their tendons in the lower limb. Putting them in that situation, doing lots of it, mm. my group generally start pretty well because we do 750, 30 metre starts. Of that, probably half of them are three point starts. Why do they need to do a lot of block work? So that's a question I'll throw up at people. Same with uh, other stuff. So think about where you want them to go and then think about where they are now and the physical qualities that they possess. And that's important. And a great comment is you can't build a Ferrari using Commodore parts. Yes, we want them to start well, but if they haven't got the chassis to be able to handle that load, why do we subject them to that? And I think that's important to recognise in so many of the events. You know, the number of jumps that we uh, ask our kids to do, short approaches, long approaches in, in all the jump events that we do, the throws, short, th you know, whether it's a lighter implement or throws. <coughs> think about that. It's really important. And then you come up with your own system of how you manage and, and monitor that. And there's lots of different roads out there to do that. I would say, arguably, the, the biggest thing I've found in private practice, the majority of the people that get injured is poor program design. And I'll go through that a little bit later. And sometimes when we do our screening for our athletes, we go, oh, they're this and they're that. Maybe that particular, what we think is a weakness, is actually a strength. Rowan Browning has got no ankle mobility. Am I going to fix that up? Absolutely not. Why? Because I think the stiffness of his ankle contributes to him running fast. But there are other things in the food chain that create problems. So when he came in, we, uh, uh, Matt, I thought, oh, your mid-back's a little bit stiff. We worked on that and all of a sudden his hamstring discomfort dropped. So there's other things along the food chain that you can look at. So when people come to see me, they've generally been to a couple of different physios or whoever. I come in, look at it holistically and try and address the problem. So we look at, okay, have a look at Give me your program. When, when you were healthiest, let's have a look at your program then. Okay, you're injured now. What have you done over the last six weeks? Generally, I don't go much further back than six. With the more advanced athletes, we'll go back two or three months. But generally, with most of the kids, I'll look at the last six weeks and any changes. So with programming, the one thing that I notice, the kids that get injured, it's an abrupt change in load that causes the problem. <coughs> so with my group, we sprint all year round. Might sound strange and fast, not just sprint. We go at 100%, and the and the window that we work in is very very narrow. So we sprint all year round, and the volumes are pretty well the same. 
within reason. There's different focuses, but that, and we find that we get very few injuries because the body is, becomes robust. The early signs um, when, they're, when they're running gait or they're throwing changes or whatever. So if, if, it, if it's a javelin throw and the tip's going down quicker than normal or whatever, have a think about, is it their shoulder mobility that's creating it? Is it their trunk? Is it their, and it can be a calf. A tight calf can create a poor foot plant, which creates a poor hip position, which creates a poor shoulder position, which creates a poor palm position that creates a ha da 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 So think about it like that. It all comes back down to the first point of contact as well. If they can't do as much training load and the quality drops, I use 30 metre times as the benchmark for assessing whether someone in their central nervous system is ready to do fast work. If someone's 30 metre times dropped on that day relative to the others and the conditions, I then assess and change my sessions. It's really important that you have something that you use and your eye is arguably the most valuable asset. Develop it. And that's why I think too often we spend too much time in front of a camera instead of developing that eye and that feel. You know, when you, and athletes, when they roll and they all roll, most of them roll poorly, but anyhow, you know, that's another discussion point. Um, but teaching them how to palpate, you know, changing gait where the lower limb is drifting out further. Maybe that's a sign that they're protecting something. So you, you, you pick that up. None of my kids do their 30s in the warm up in groups. We do it more singularly. One, so I can watch them. Two, it gives them more time to recover when there's a big group of 12. Um, and they can focus on a technical model. We never do our 30s uh, as a group. Why? Because they go to a major and they've got to warm up by themselves. They've got to do their 30s by themselves. They've got to do the block work by themselves. So I'm always thinking about, well, at a major, this is what we're going to do. So we're going to do it here. And it's just rolled on and it's just been part of my group. Everybody knows. We do our drills in single lines. We don't do them as a collective. So I can watch things and, and point out stuff. I thought I'd change the colour just to wake you all up. I thought that was good. Do you like that one, John? <laughs> just had a chat about... Back in the old days, we used to do video uh, these and we do, you know, everybody do the music and stuff. I've gone away from that. I keep it really simple now. I just have slides and I try and engage people. So poor programming and is arguably the biggest concern for me in terms of injuries. So think about when someone's injured, have a look at your program and be proud to say, well, maybe I could have done it differently. Generally, it's an increase um, load, a decrease in recovery and recovery comes in a lot of different ways, and I'll go into that in a, in a different slide. You get an injury because the body can't cope with the load. Simple as that. No magic formula. So progressive overload principle, and generally not more than 10%. If you gradually increase the load, you've got less risk. Poor biomechanics, looking at the way their foot hits, the way the arm is. If the palm is below the shoulder, they're in trouble. You know, um, can't, don't know enough about the discus and shot put injury. So, um, and again, um, in the jumps, planning out there in the hurdles, uh, landing too far forward, a whole lot of stuff like that. And muscles become too tight, there's an imbalance, and then you create a whole lot of other problems and deficiencies. But it comes back to the athlete as well. They've got to start taking some control of their own destiny as well. Recovery and modalities. Um, just on that last slide, yep. you talk about a 10% increase in any given load. What's your period? Oh, between sessions over years as well. That's, that's, that's a ballpark number. It's just something that I've used, and I'm sure a lot of us use it as well. So if we were going from one week to another, I wouldn't do much more than 10%. I only ever change one variable in any given period. So if we... If, I do whatever I do on a Monday, I'll continue on a Monday all the way through the cycle for a month. And the reason I do that is the kids are at school, they're doing this, they're doing that or whatever or Tuesday. And I think they need some level of um, consistency. In an ideal world, if I had a full-time athlete, I'd probably run a 10-day cycle or a five-day cycle or whatever we were doing at the time. But with kids, you actually have to work a seven-day cycle. It's just too hard. And I work on it. You know, they've got to go to school, they've got work, the university kids, you need some form of... And you take all that into account. Yep. So 
So a 10% increase in load could be because of extra work they're doing at uni or extra work they're doing at school. Yeah, it, when, when they're at exam period, I drop the load for the kids and I drop it a week or two weeks before they go into exams. And then they're left on their own devices to, and I engage my kids during the exam period to uh, allocate uh, study time and then go out and do something, but they don't come out with me. So if they might have a significant part in training over months where there's no increase in any load. Correct. So... But what tends to happen is I generally have a two-week lead into exams and a two-week post-exams. I find those two weeks either side are dangerous periods. If you look at the kids who get hurt post-exams, enormous amount over the years of uh, therapy. Well, if it doesn't happen two weeks, it's the third week. You know, and that's that offload period. Because what happens is they stop running, their body can cope for a little bit, and then it's the deload that creates as many problems as overload. Just be mindful of that. Yep. Do, you have the, do you have the conundrum that we have in New Zealand in that our secondary school championships is right at the end of exams that have been going on for three weeks? Ours is not. Ours is just before the exams. It's the week before, which is just crazy. <laughs> but it is what it is. You can't, you've got to work yeah, within we, it. We do it. We work through it. But, yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's a tough one because, um, I mean, I know there's a number of people have been doing some research in that whole process. But for me, um, I'm really low... And I program that in, into my annual program. So at the bottom of my annual program, there's the weeks, the years, I put in the school holiday period, and then the week of the, oh, so we have uh, T11, which means term one, week one, and then I know which part of the year they're in. Some of the kids at the moment have just gone on a three week break. Other kids in my uh, squad have a two week break at this time of year. So, but I know wh where the school term is, because all of the kids that I've got, apart from three, I think, uh, athletes I've got in my group, are all at school or at uni. The uni ones, um, I have uni one all the way through. It's only two semesters. Yeah. Can yep. I just ask, yeah. um, when you <coughs> factor in the study, which obviously is always an issue, hmm. what about the other sports and activities? Yeah, that, oh, look, I'm lucky, yeah. And that's the other problem. I've got, uh, my better kids play other sports. so. Um, if, if they've got hockey training on a Wednesday, um, we offload them on the, on the Tuesday or they don't come. Or what happens now is we've negotiated with the clubs where if they're a, they're really, their primary sport is track and field, that then they go out and they do hockey, uh, say, three times a fortnight instead of four times. So you've got to negotiate with the parents and the coaches from the other codes. The one, the one code that non-compliant, well, there's two codes that I find really difficult to deal with. Uh, basketball are a nightmare to deal with because they have to turn up. That's my experience. And the other one uh, are the soccer, the soccer coaches. There are the AFL people are pretty good. They are very, very, very good. As a general rule, the clubs that I've dealt with, the football people are far more able to deal with that sort of stuff when kids are playing multiple sports. So no, so oh no, they're they're just on another planet. I just don't talk to me about rowing. Rowing is just somewhere out there. They've come up with their own, because they reckon their bodies work differently than everybody else's. Anyhow, I'm not going into that. So. Sitting down and going backwards. <laughs> oh, look, they do work hard. Okay, I'm a big fan of sea rather than pool for recovery modalities. I think there's a couple of different things. I think the salt in the water does help. Um, I think it's a great social activity. In winter, we use pool recovery stuff. I use contrasting things from spas to ice bars to uh, contrast showers. Very simple. Does it need to be programmed? Absolutely it does. You don't just do it because you've got the time to do it. Massaging and all that stuff. This is uh, my kids when they were young and they, all, they were watching me so they could massage. My kids have got very good hands, I can tell you. Mum's a physio, so, so Max treats mum now. It's really good because I don't touch her because she doesn't touch me. So we have a very good understanding. Husband and wife, we get the kids to treat uh, mum. So, okay, so it needs to be programmed. Uh, and it, is there a right or wrong? No. I had one person, Sean Carlin, who was 120 kilos at the time, uh, hammer thrower, 
who didn't want a massage post Monday because it took him four or five days to recover before he could compete the next week. Yet I've got little distance runners who preferred Fridays and they were competing on Saturdays. No rhyme or reason. The one thing I don't like doing is doing deep connective tissue massage and then them going out and training that day. Not a fan of it, but there's some people who survive on it. I don't know what, how they can do it, but they do. Um, so we work through and we keep notes and we go, okay, when's the best time? So most of my people get their massages midweek, Wednesday and then Friday. So Monday, I, they generally don't have it the night after training. My son has just broken the Guinness Book of Records of having the most soft tissue therapies for any child under the age of 16. He, you know, and when he was going through his growth pains, he, we had him, he was getting soft tissue work three times a week and he had very, very few sessions where he missed. So it does work, it's expensive though, and it's probably best done by parents rather than coming and paying for someone like me. But we sort of talked through that with people. What happened to those people down the bottom right corner there? That, oh, sorry. That's uh, that's the hot. They were they were exhausted. That's uh, after really after tough training session. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but you know, you're talking about a silver medal. Um, so there, Todd Bateman came ninth at World Juniors that year. Uh, uh, Lauren Foot heptathlete sprinter, and Mark Ormrod got a silver at the Olympics in the four by four. So that was just going into the nationals. That photo. They were really tough sessions but you know I don't do them a lot but when they are there um, the hidden tools in in recovery and we never talk about the quality of the footwear and rotating your shoes I'm not a big fan of kids walking around all day in their shoes and then coming and train with it. it's not really good the shoes not made for that it loses its ability to take shock so think about that the uh, moisture that the shoe gathers um, affects its ability to absorb shock. Okay. Um, spikes and specialised shoes, I prefer them to ha not train and race in the same spikes if they're doing four or five sessions a week, you know, and for the longer sessions in particular, have a little bit more support. That's not always financially viable, but this is the ideal word. Orthotics, soft or hard, I'm not a big fan of hard orthotics when they're running, prefer wedges and or form orthotics. They, uh, and again, that's another error, but that just throws up the thought. Um, what I want people to think about is things like clothing. Socks are critical. Make sure, one, they're clean, hygiene. Two, for me as a coach, I don't need to smell things that are terrible. And having been in football clubs, I can tell you that's terrible. Um, compression garments, uh, long tights are really important and they're recovery tools. They help them stay warm, help them with the blood flow. And I think it's really important that we don't just consider lower limb, but we also consider upper limb. So in winter, I engage my kids to wear upper body tights and then, you know, rollers and massage balls and all that sort of stuff. One of the hidden tools we never talk about is hydration. I test my kids a couple of times a year with hydration. I'm fortunate enough that I've got little kits about two grand's worth in my office a lot of little toys in my office um, and we look at the hydration level it's about educating them so they turn up to training dehydrated one they're not going to train as well two they're not going to concentrate and they become ratty and three the quality of the performance is poor increased risk of injury so i so they get a little bottle and um, they present that to me prior to training i prefer morning urines but that's what uh, i do nutrition They've been at school all day, they're starving, they come to training. Is that ideal? Mm, anyhow, I prefer them to have at least think about it. So at three o'clock, if we're training at 4.30, that's when they you know, have a snack between, between classes. So they've got to think about food prior to getting to training and not have a Mars bar or chips, which is the easiest thing to do. And then they know they can't bring any of that rubbish out to training because I'll do my nut. Um, and, I, and by the way, if you make those rules, you've got to abide by them. So I don't have soft drinks. I don't, I mean, I do have a glass of red, which I'm allowed to at my age to enjoy and relax. I call it therapeutic uh, stimulus. And, but, you know, I think that's important that we do that as well. So if we're going to put some rules on the kids, make sure you can abide. I only drink water. And that's another story if you ever get to get a chance to hear me talk about that. Sleep hygiene, arguably poorly understood. The environment that you sleep in will, will give you the quality of the recovery that you have. I would argue that 
Sleep is one of the poorest recovery tools we ever think about. Making sure you get into a routine. You wake up at the same time every day, even during holidays, because that affects their recovery. It's amazing, because otherwise what they do is they're on this at one o'clock and two o'clock in the morning. The quality of the bed, the surrounding, the temperature, you've got to think about that. What is the most comfortable thing for them to be in? <coughs> the bed is used for sleeping, not sitting on your phone, getting blue light. That's critical. You've got to learn to relax before you go to bed. So I and my wife have developed this routine where we have a relaxing tea, which is non-caffeine, green tea, whatever you want to do. And we've got a real lot out of that. And that's gone through with our kids. And, you know, some of the kids take it on board, others don't. Obviously, you've got to avoid alcohol, caffeine, late meals and distractions. Phone calls is the biggest distraction. And in our age, it's really tough to try and get that over the kids. One of the parents I have, when the kids go to bed, they take their phones from them. I'm trying to be, not be as tough as that. I'm trying to at least get them to drive that themselves. When we talk about recovery, they go, oh, this is the ideal recovery tool. Yeah, we've got a, a long jumper here, a middle distance run, a javelin throw, and we give them the same recovery. Give me a break. Are you for sure? Real? One's got enormous amount of mean muscle mass. One is working you know, aerobically a lot more and the other one's an anaerobic beast and we give them the same recovery modalities? I don't think so. So just think about it, what's ideal? I found with our sprinters that the really cold baths worked far better. I couldn't put a distance runner in a 4.5 degree bath. Now I was at Sassy, we could get the water to within 0.1 of a degree accurate in terms of what we did. We found that by 20 to 30 seconds had a significant influence. Yet with a distance runner, we would have them at eight to 12 degrees because we're looking at different metabolic recovery and central nervous system. This isn't a topic, that's, a, that's a, a presentation I do as a whole, but I'm just throwing that up. Think about it and when and how. How long were they in the very cold water? 20 to 30 seconds. And then they go into a, a shower. All together, not in no, no, no. five seconds? Or... No, no. Well, we had, I was lucky we had a single bath and we had it at four and a half degrees and I just kept on topping ice because as you go in, it increases the temperature. And they just do one shot of 30 seconds? No, so they go hot, they'll go 30 seconds, they go into a, contra a contrast shower, hot and cold, and then they go into the spa and then they had a sauna and then we rotated. It took about an hour and a half. We did that once a week. It was really valuable. Um, with the distance runners, um, we had a couple of walkers that came in that were blessed to be around the, um, the sprinter. Sorry, Smithy, I thought you'd like that one. Um, but I've had a few walkers come into the program. They've really enjoyed being around, you know, the other event groups um, and, um, and just taking on a lot of that other stuff. They're in the gym with us as well. And, they, you know, they're different programs, but they, they get on pretty well. Uh, and I've liked having other sports and other event groups within my group. It just it gives it a better balance, you know. Um, look, arguably, I think pre-training assessment, you cannot beat a good eye. And I talk about a life filter. You listen to the athlete. And if you go to places like Altus, the one thing that they do is they speak to their athletes prior to training. I was fortunate enough in 2000, John Smith's therapist got sick. And so Margaret Marnie of AA rang me and said, oh, would you mind recommending someone? So well, I'm, we were at finished football season because we had to finish football season early that year. Um, and I, I spent some time with John um, in his group. He doesn't let too many people come in, by the way, but I was a therapist and then he worked out I was coaching light though. Couldn't believe that I had, had time to do both. But the one thing that he would look at, he'd look at the athlete and if they weren't right, he'd send them home. Oh, you're only doing a warm up. It's just amazing. He had an incredible ability to be able to smell whether someone was tired by the way they were walked into the training, their demeanor, you know, a whole lot of stuff and it was just invaluable. Mick Malthouse, interesting cat, if you've ever get to meet him. Um, you know, it's a good example, just listen. So you just listen to them. Take the emotion out of it and you've got to have a really good relationship with your athlete. And once you do that, I think you can... My athletes now trust me when I say go home, they know I'm doing it for a reason. Oh, but I want to train. They don't question me as often anymore because they know that, okay, why? I go, well, how about we do this, this and this? The higher up the food chain they go, 
the harder it is to send them home. So you've got to find other activities to keep them. Because some of them will go off and do the training on their own. Mine don't, because if they find out, they know the consequences. Um, testing, if you're going to test, do it regularly, I think. And if it doesn't change your program, I'd, I'd question why you do it, unless you're finding base models. Um, and this is one thing that I had an opportunity with Dan. Um, he went out to <coughs> dinner with him and it's called that piece of paper. You, you walk out to training, you've got a piece of paper, you've written down what you're doing, right? It controls your life. What I'm saying is, I now memorize what we're doing, go out, know what I'm doing as a framework and then modify from there. Whereas if I'm looking at the paper, it, for whatever reason, I know, maybe I'm just an odd one, but I tend to want to follow it. So just be mindful that sometimes that piece of paper can be detrimental. You know, have the confidence that you know what you're doing on your feet. You know what you've planned. If it works out great, I don't tend to change too much in winter, but in summer, I, trying to write a program in summer is a nightmare coming into majors. You've got to see what you see, look at what they're doing, and then work forward. And the coaches who do that well generally have a lot of success. So that's just a, a warning. And look, post-training, there's two things that you need to think about at training. It's not just the physical recovery, it's the mental recovery. So I talked to the athletes about what I want before, but at the end we sit down and we talk about, oh, I thought you achieved this, this is where you could have improved, this is where we're going to go the next session. So you give them a heads up of what's going on. And that mental relaxation and confidence, they leave training feeling internally fantastic and what happens is that they turn up with more energy the next time. If they leave depressed, you can find that they will not come back really resilient the next time. So think about the next session at the end of the previous session, because that helps. You know, them self-massaging, Epsom bolt, bolt. I'm not a big fan of stretching after training. You've just smashed them in the sprints. So trying to stretch a muscle that's been uh, exposed I'd question it. Let it recover, water, food, walk, mental relaxation, go home, have something to eat, then stretch. Get a lot more out of it. We warm down in summer and a little bit in winter to some, sometimes. It's a term that I've called connecting with the earth. Recovery isn't just physical, it's mental. So taking their shoes off, they connect, they feel a little bit more relaxed. They're not in an enclosed environment and you find that that's what I've done with my group. So my group walk around the track barefoot, have a little bit of a chat, and um, you find that they leave training really um, more relaxed. And I'm a big fan. I don't like people leaving training stressed. Oh, I didn't train well or whatever. So you've got to engage them. And generally, I let them do it. If someone's got a problem, I go for a walk with them. People know that when I go for a walk singly, we're having a discussion about something, but it is what it is. And in summary... The five pillars of recovery, program design and skill development are arguably the two most important things. Um, in a regular routine, small change of variations in stimulus and then change that over a long period of time. Clearly, lifestyle is massive. And if you don't understand or take into account that, you're going to have real problems. And then, you know, the psychological well-being. You know, they've got to feel like they're enjoying that importantly. And the therapy isn't therapy. Not everybody can paint a Picasso. So massage is a massage, physio is a physio. It's not just about the qualifications of these people, it's about them as a person and the energy they bring to the table and their ability as a therapist to engage with the coach and the athlete, to build confidence. So people come to me because the one thing that I'm... I, I, I suppose, problem myself, and is the ability to convince people that what we're going to do is going to work. And, you know, that's happened over a long period of time. One, because I was athlete, coach, manager, sports scientist. So, you know, it just helps. And again, it's taken 40 years to develop the skill sets. So to finish off, do the simple things, do them well, do them consistently. The greatest athletes in the world do the simple things, they do them well, they do them all the time. Bang. Simple. I'll leave you with this quote and you can think about it. If the only tool that you have is a hammer, then everything becomes a nail. Think about it to be a good discussion point.